our assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. Um, and our office is opposed to his, his request. Um, the facts that were, were brought out in trial is that he put his hands on his neighbor, Dina Noyle. She told her brother about it, and he came over to have a discussion um, with Mr. Stacker. Uh, they spoke. Uh, Mr. Stacker got rowdy, pulled out a pistol, aimed it at Singleton, and pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. Uh, he then went to his apartment, fixed the gun, fired two shots inside the apartment, and then and exited the, the uh, apartment, which was across the alleyway from Dina's apartment, had his gun in his hand, got into a fight with Singleton, and shot him in the mouth. We are about to watch the parole hearing of a man who was convicted of attempted second-degree murder in October of 2001. We have two new parole board members here, both the preacher and the sheriff. Let's jump in, and I'll unpack it with the appeal documents at the end. Uh, Mr. Sacker, you're classified as a second felony offender. You're currently serving a 50-year sentence uh, for attempted second-degree murder in Jefferson Parish. Your parole eligibility date was October 5th, 2021. Good time date is August 7th, 2043. Does all that information sound correct? Yes, ma'am. So, okay. So, Mr. Sacker, um, how old are you, sir? Yes, ma'am. And how long have you um, been in jail? 22 years. So you served 22 years of your 50-year sentence. Yes. So you were, how old were you when this crime occurred? 28. And so why don't you tell us what happened? Uh, why are you in jail? A lot of drinking and a fight ensued. Okay. Ma'am? You know, I didn't say anything. I want to know what happened the night of this crime. Right. A lot of drinking, a uh, fight ensued, and I pulled the gun and fired. But it didn't fire, right? And then, and then what happened? Well, ma'am, it was on safety. It was on safety. Then I what happened? Safety. I made a statement and said I could have shot you and I walked away. And as I was shutting the door, it was like pushed open. And I went in panic mode. It was a cowardly move. I went in panic mode and pushed, pushed the door all the way open. And I chased uh, the victim. And we he turned around, we started fighting, and I shot him. Well, well, I, got, well, I got the, you know, I have the record and the um I got you got the chase part right, mm -hmm. but 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 what what I gleaned from what I read was uh, the victim was trying to resolve an argument between you and another somebody else, uh, and then you pulled a gun and you pulled the trigger, but it didn't fire. You went home to fix the gun, then you went back, then you shot the victim in the mouth, and then you chased him and shot at him numerous more times. Does that sound familiar? The part about shooting him in the, in the mouth, yes, ma'am. But the pursuit and firing, no, ma'am. And you didn't go home to fix the gun? So I went in the apartment to shut the door because the gun was on safety. I didn't. My intention wasn't to shoot. But when the door came open, I panicked and I ran out and I, I took it off safety and I shot him. I own up to it. I did. I did do it. But you pointed it at him before and tried to fire it, but it was on safety. Yes, it was on safety. I so put you, it on safety. You know, why would you have a gun if you're not going to intend to shoot it? So, okay, so we know what happened. Uh, let's get to your record. I noticed you have 270 days of good time credits. Let's right. tell us tell us about, I know that's program completions. Which of those programs that you earned those 270 days for, which one did you get the most out of? Victim impact. I, got well, a, I learned, I learned a lot. Okay. It, it teaches you to, even though you're suffering and going through years of incarceration, we, we were not the victim. The victims are the people we did the crime against. And it helps you to understand that 
they the ones that you 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 really halted their life, harmed them and their families. It's more than just them. It's the family members, your family members. You you affected a lot of people. Well, I affected a lot of people with my my silly act of violence. I affected a lot of lives. When did you take that victim into class? I took yeah. that one here. That was the last one. I took that one at Allen, Allen Correction Center. So, and you've been there how long? Since. A little over since. about a year, almost a year? Yes, ma'am. And and where were you before that, before Allen? I went, they sent me to Raymond. Raymond Boy. Boy. Yeah, LaVore. And then you're in Angola for a little while. I notice when I look at your record, you've been in and out of the hospital. You have medical issues? I had a massive heart attack in 2020. And it, it, it left me on multiple medications. And I have to keep nitroglycerin in case it, it worsens. So that, that pretty much limits my... Uh, Ability to do a lot of physical things, but as far as work goes, I, I still could do a, a lot. It's just not too much so in the heat because the medications I take, they like right. on your skin, basically. So, do you have a job? Yes, ma'am. What are you doing? I'm a dorm orderly and I, I assist with the elderly. And I live in like a, a elderly dorm. And I push them to the hospital, push them to the child and things like that. Do a lot of cleaning, take the laundry, multiple things. So let's talk about your conduct record. What's that look like? Pretty much outside of having a duty status that stipulates I don't go in the field. Pretty much. Basically, that's the only thing I've been getting wrote up for. Until my medical records, records catch up with me, they do their protocol. If you, you can't work, then they have to write you up. But once I present the situation, they don't lock me up. They don't put me in the dungeon. They just may write me up. And I have a grievance I filed at both institutions, and it stipulates out of field on there. But they never took the uh, write-ups out of my jacket, but they never locked me up or put me in the dungeon or nothing like that. So the last one was in 2022? That's right. And then where was that at? Where were you? I was at Cottonport. Uh, look, look. Right. Yes, yes ma'am. So you got two in 2022 for uh, work events. Yes, ma'am. And so and one was in February and one was in November. So you, it took them that long to get your medical record? Yes, ma'am. And they answer the grievance, I have the grievance with me. And in the grievance, they like, okay, you have out of field duty status, it's stipulated. But they never re removed the write-ups out of my, uh, my jacket. All right, when did you learn you were parole eligible? October the 21st. It was like three weeks after I became eligible. They sent me a letter saying, well, you eligible for parole. And you need a uh, pre-release. So I was like, okay, let's get it started. But the next month they moved to Cotton Port. When I got to Cotton Port, I got in a pre-release program and completed that uh, anger management. Uh, I took substance abuse in Angola. I took a uh, thing for a change, which is living in balance. I took that in Angola. Uh, a bunch of religious-based uh, programs I completed, but you don't get good time credits because you only get like 300 and maybe 50 or something like that. So I guess what I'm getting at is the record at least reflects that you didn't start working on these self-help programs until you learned you were parole eligible. That's what it looks like to me. That's right. Except, except the drug abuse and the, the religious-based programs, I took those even at the time. It was like I'm exhausting all my, my court remedies and it felt like I had no hope. But I never <laughs> got like violent and fighting and, and getting into a security. I don't have none of that kind of stuff. I never went like that. It just was mainly trying to maintain and, and study going to court till you get denied at each level. So I had no hope until the laws changed. And I was like, okay, I finally have hope. 
And I just jumped in the programs and poured all my energy in to positive things. I pretty much been positive the whole while I was there. That's why I have not one fight, not one act of violence against security inmates, nobody in over 22 years, because I'm a peacekeeper. I'd rather keep the peace and get along opposed to just ruckus and everything that's sending the prison. Why does your record say you have no history of substance abuse? I have no idea, but I have my certificate. For a, for a chemical dependency uh, program you took? I, I saw that. But then there, I did see where it says you had no history of substance abuse, which would seem as though you might have reported that to somebody, that you didn't have a drug problem. Never had, ma'am. Never had. Never had a drug problem? So the night this attempted murder occurred, you, you, there were no drugs involved? No, just alcohol. Just alcohol. Party. So you have a substance abuse problem. It's just not drugs. It's alcohol. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, I'm just going to sit back and listen. Do my colleagues have any other questions? Hello, where you're at, Angola? Uh, 19 years, 20, 19 or 20 years. Thank you. You have many problems there? As Why? far as, sir? You had many problems when you were there? Breaking the rules or violating any, any of the rules? Yeah, I had like basically work offenses. That's about it. You do multiple jobs and it's never enough. But you sent us to all eight, so you do as much as you could, and all the extras, you either do them or you don't. But you try to play by the rules as much as possible because the sales and dungeons that only make the time harder. Do you feel now that uh, where you are now, you're in a better position and you're on the road of trying to do what's correct? Yes, sir. I have hope. I have a. Uh, something to strive for to get better to live life again possibly it's a totally different world good yeah, thank you how old were you when this shooting occurred 28 sir okay that's kind of a late bloomer usually we see people involved in shootings that in their teens and early 20s and you get to be 28 why do you think that was? Well, as a truck driver, it was, I'm not blaming it on that. It just was coming home and try to enjoy one and a half days of home. And I just made a horrible decision. That isolated incident haunt me to this day. I regret it. Uh, I wish I could take it back, but it, it happened. And, my world changed, the victim's world changed, his family world changed. Stupid decision. Yes. Very stupid. Okay. That's all I have. Warden Thompson, what can you tell us about Mr. Stacker? Um, Mr. Stacker and I talked just uh, on yesterday, and I mean, the best of life I can pretty much give to him, just continue on to try to seek any type of uh, self-help classes. There's always room for improve, improvement. Um, there's a class here that, that we have to conduct here, which is the uh, boys and men class, which would be something, something good for the guys to get involved in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, let's hear from the support now. Could we hear from Mr. Myers with the Parole Project? Hey, yes, good morning. Kerry Myers with the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, Parole Project uh, has committed to support Mr. Stacker uh, should this board grant him a release. Uh, our program is is designed uh, to help him uh, through this transition, particularly uh, someone who has served more than 20 years uh, of incarceration. Our program will provide him with a case manager uh, who will be his his mentor, and he will also go through programming. That includes the things that have significantly changed uh, since his incarceration, like technology, uh, financial um, literacy and financial management, uh, social norms, uh, consumer skills, the things that he would need. Mr. Stacker does have a support system. Uh, he has a, a, a long-term residence plan uh, with his sister. He has uh, an employment plan. 
uh, parole project will provide him case management uh, uh, at a minimum of one year. Uh, and again, uh, should this board decide uh, to grant Mr. Stacker based on his age, uh, he's, he's highly unlikely uh, to make the same decisions he made uh, 22 years ago. Um, he's uh, completed the chemical dependency uh, program. Uh, we have confidence that he'll, he'll uh, and we'll make sure through evaluation that his sobriety uh, is, is a priority to him. Uh, and so we just ask this board to consider that in, in, in your review today. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to hear from Ms. Melody Stacker. You're, you're still on mute. Yeah, good morning. Hi, my name is Melody Stacker. I'm Edmund Stacker's sister. This has been a long journey, um, hard time for the family. But through it all, we are a religious family and we support him 100%. My mom didn't make it, she's died. So I had to carry on for my mom. And I think he'll do well. He looks like a change. He never really was a troubled person. He was quiet and a hard working man. But situation, that situation turned real ugly, real bad, real quick. And I think everybody has suffered the consequences, including him. We love him and we like to see him home, you know, so I could take care of him for the rest of his days. And he just watch over me. I thank you for listening to me. Ma'am. All right. Terrence Wynn, could we hear from you, sir? Hello, once again. Uh, I know Mr. Stack. He's a, like you hey, say, he's a real Mr. person. Mr. Wynn, Mr. Wynn, we need you to pull over and stop for him. Yes, you know, talk to us. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, I know Mr. Stacker personally, and he's uh, a real peaceful person. He's a, he's a person, like Mr. Miles said, that would not be, a, he would not come back to prison. And I'm here to support him any way he needs support, whether it's job or any type of support, because people coming home from prison really need support, especially where the person understands, because it's a lot of traumas that that a person faces in prison. So I'm here to give him that support in any kind of way he needs. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, let me ask Mr. Stacker, is there a statement you'd like to make before we ask the DA to close it out for us? Yes, ma'am. The situation that happened 22 years ago I was a grown man at 28. I regret what I did. And if I could apologize to the victim and his family, I would. I know I put him through changes. And I, I depend on the mercy of the board to grant me one shot. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Meyer. I apologize. Thank you. Yes, Would you close it out for us? I apologize. No problem. Yeah, I caught it. Uh, Randy Meyer, Assistant DA in Jefferson Parish. Um, and our office is opposed to his his request at this time. Uh, one reason is that. Uh, it doesn't appear that he's being honest with the board as to what happened with the facts of the situation. Um, the facts that were, were brought out in trial is that he put his hands on his neighbor, Dina Noyle. She told her brother about it and he came over to have a discussion uh, with Mr. Stacker. Uh, they spoke, uh, Mr. Stacker got rowdy, pulled out a pistol, aimed it at Singleton and pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. Uh, he then went to his apartment, fixed the gun, fired two shots inside the apartment, and then and 
exited the, the uh, apartment, which was across the alleyway from Dina's apartment, had his gun in his hand, got into a fight with Singleton, and shot him in the mouth. Um, Singleton then fled to his sister's apartment, and Dina told Mr. Um, Stacker that uh, don't shoot him, and, and he was shooting at him as a chase. He told, she told him that there were children in the apartment. Please don't shoot them. And he continued to fire. He fired two shots into the apartment. And uh, Dina Knowles discovered one of the bullets on the floor of their home a few days later. Um, it's a little bit different from the facts that he uh, told the board, I mean, the parole committee what occurred. So now let's look at, at his, what he's done since he's been incarcerated. Um, He's had 64 write-ups since 2002. He's had one every year except 2017. And then in uh, November of 22 was his last disciplinary report. So he had none in 23 and none so far in 2024. Um, numerous, a, a whole lot of his write-ups were for contraband and aggravated work offenses. He had 13 aggravated work offenses since 2015. Um, uh, it's concerning with the number of disciplinary reports and, and how long he's had them. I truly would like to see uh, people who get granted or you know considered for parole to have a longer time period following the rules before they're released. Um, I also have concern with his programming. I think it's very limited. Um, he's the only program he's taken that we have a record of was chemical dependency and. 2004 up until he became got knowledge of his parole eligibility in 22 he took 100 hours in anger management in 2022 i think additional programming would benefit him substantially before he would be released and would would give him a much better opportunity of uh, following the rules and staying crime free once he is released uh, so in, until he completes additional programming, which which I, I think uh, some additional substance abuse classes would also be beneficial. It's been 2024, 20, so 20 years since he's had any kind of substance abuse classes. Uh, so without those additional programming and, and more time uh, right up free, we will remain opposed to his request. All right, thank you, sir. Um, all right, I think uh, I'll move for an executive session to discuss confidential matters. Can you get a second? Second. Okay, in the roll call. Joe Arnason? Yes. Steve Carter? Yes. Chuck Tibbs? Yes. Yes, so we'll be in executive session for a few moments to discuss confidential matters. We'll be right back, Mr. Stacker. Yeah. This thing on me. The last big potato. Hmm? The last big potato. What? I'm saying the last big potato. They, they took everything and twisted it up. I'm still in jail. I'm surprised. Man. So I put my hands on one. <laughs> I've never been in jail in my life. So, you know, where would I stay at the The executive session was on the long side, a little over 10 minutes. And just those few moments where we caught the hot mic I left in there, I tried to get my editing software, which I'm still, you know, figuring out how to get the volume up as high as possible. It was really like twice as quiet. I still don't think I quite heard everything to me it sounds like he's talking about a hot potato but then he says something about putting your hands on a woman and then this is the first time he's in prison and overall my impression of it was not positive it seemed like he was being lackadaisy and kind of like you know you could kind of see where there's no more act and uh, this is how i truly feel i shouldn't be here um that's just my impression if any of you have a, are pretty confident that you heard what he said, put it in the comment section and I'll pin it. If I don't pin it, email me so I can find it and I'll pin it. But let's jump in. Do you think, do you think they're going to parole him? 
Let's find it out. All right, Mr. Stacker, we're back in session. Oh, and we're ready, ready to vote. Um, and I'll go first. <clears throat> you know, I worry about your your um desire to change because you didn't start really working hard on yourself till you knew you might have hope to get out. And so, you know, for me, that's want me, you know, I wonder if you're really sincere about it. I mean, I know you want to get out, but for us, it's about you getting out and staying out. And I would have liked to have seen a, a longer period of you working on yourself. I heard what the warden said about the boys to men program may be of some benefit to you. Are you familiar with that program? Yes, ma'am. How long is that program, Warden? Uh, you have six different phases to it. So technically speaking, you're doing it at least about six months of a course. Okay. All right. And um, do you have a substance abuse program there at Allen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma All right. Mr. Sacker. Yes, ma'am. I would be willing to give you a shot if you to grant your parole after you complete the Boys to Men program that was recommended by the warden. Also complete the, whatever the substance abuse program is that is offered at Allen. Yes, ma'am. And then only then after successful completion of those programs and you remain right up free for all that time. Uh, parole you to the parole project to go through their transition program. And 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 we know their program, so I know they're going to ask for, you know, you're going to have to have substance abuse evaluation and you're going to have to do whatever they tell you to do. And they're going to follow you long term. What What is your employment plan if you, whenever you're released? What are you going to do? You're still young enough to work. What are you going to do? Uh, the parole project, they have a program to help me get my C renew my CDL and back to driving trucks. That's where the money is. So that's a big truck we're talking about. Not like a hot shot truck, a big truck. Great <laughs> uh tractor trip. All right. Um I'm going to add special condition after release that you attend three AA meetings a week. Uh, mm -hmm. And and um, we'll work with the parole project on another condition to be sure you maintain your sobriety uh, once you get back to start to driving trucks. Yes, ma'am. I'll figure that out. I, I had wanted to put an interlock device, which is the thing you blow in, you know, to be sure you're not drinking. But if you're driving a commercial truck, I don't think that'll work. So I'm going to. Reserve that. I'll find something. That's my bad, Mr. Fraker. I concur. I concur and wish you well. Hope you do well. I think you will. You're on the right track. Mr. Tillis. Uh, I hope that you're sincere. And uh, the uh, drug or the alcohol is serious. And I think you've done 22 years so far. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I think you're capable of doing another 22 years, but I, I, I think you need some, need a chance. And I agree with my colleagues. All right, Mr. Stacker, it's up excuse, to you. Excuse me, Mr. Anastas. Yes. You know, an option other than the uh, analog device would be a scram bracelet for the alcohol. All right, I'll add that as a special condition also. Thank you, Mr. Meyer, I appreciate it. So we're gonna add that, a scram bracelet. That'll detect alcohol if you have any in your system. So good luck to you, Mr. Stacker. Thank you. Thank you. All right, look, this is what I'm going to do. After this parole, boy, you wait for my day, I'm going to get with you. I'm going to put you in that boys to men program. Well, I actually was caught a little bit uh, by surprise there. I didn't think that they would grant. Um, I mean, he has. 64 write-ups since being locked up with many of them coming somewhat you know up until when was it when when he started to figure out he can get parole 
I feel, I, I'm actually this one actually caught me off guard because of all the other hearings we've been seeing they've been pretty strict and they haven't been so lenient. Maybe it was because we didn't see the actual victims there at the hearing. Um, of course, we had Randy Meyer, but he always shows up. Although it does seem like a trend that the DAs are showing up to to, to these hearings, unlike they have previously. We'll go over the court documents that Richard provided, but it seemed that we had gotten three different accounts of what happened. We had like Miss Renatza's, we had his, and we had Randy Myers, and I will read the court document. And he, he kind of just straight up denied it and was, it's int quite interesting, but he didn't seem to take any accountability or I shouldn't say any accountability, but he, he didn't take, it wasn't a ton of accountability. Even when he spoke about the crime, he said, I wish I could take it back. I wish it never happened, but it did. And I have to suffer the consequences. And so do they. And it's like, I mean, I guess he's lucky he didn't kill a man. And maybe that has to do with it. He served 22 years. The man didn't die. Um, he had a 52 year sentence, but it was attempted. And that's the bottom line is that he served 22 years, but he seemed to just deny it. And Mr. Renasa, like even, you know, Mr. Renasa accepted that she cut, he cut him off. She, she's like, we, we know what happened. And she just went on. It was, it was like, none of it made a difference. Well, the parole projects there, you served 22 years. Act one, two, two, we'll let you out. I mean, but so let's, uh, let's go look at this. This is his appeal. And it doesn't have a ton of information, but it says here that, um, so it went to trial, right, on April of 2002. After two days of testimony, the jury unanimously found him guilty as charged. I don't know how, like, what his defense was going to be, right? Um, the day the defendant waived a statutory sentencing delay, the trial court then sentenced him to 50 years. So he wrote uh, um, an appeal to reconsider the sentence. So facts. In October 2001, the defendant put his hands on his neighbor during a discussion about the defendant's niece. On October 5th, 2001, Dina told her brother, Cornelius, about the incident. So he, so he said about the incident of him putting the hand on his niece, which what does that mean? You know, I don't know. The evening while Singleton was visiting his sister, he approached the defendant to speak with him about the incident. During that conversation, the defendant became rowdy so the man's going to talk to him about the niece touching. And during that incident, he became rowdy, pulled out a pistol and aimed it at him. And although the defendant pulled the trigger, the gun did not fire properly and no bullet was released from the chamber because the safety was on. So he, he, he can't take it. He's, he, you know, he's there. The guy yells at him. He pulls out his weapon and shoots. He's lucky. He's given a blessing. The safety's on. Wow, but no, he can't. He claims his safety was on, or Mr. Nazi claimed the safety was on. Now, when I continue reading it, the defendant then returned to his apartment to fix the gun. So maybe it, it had nothing to do with the safety. Something else had to have been wrong with it. He fired two shots inside the apartment immediately. He then exited his apartment across the alley from Dina's apartment with the gun in his hand. He ran towards Singleton, who was standing in the alleyway. When the defendant attempted to strike Singleton in the face with his left hand, Singleton blocked the blow. The defendant, who was holding the gun in the right hand, then shot Singleton in the mouth. Wow. So... Okay. After being shot, Singleton ran towards his sister's apartment with the defendant chasing him and shooting at him. After he entered the apartment, he ran upstairs. Dina, who was still outside of her apartment in the alleyway, begged the defendant not to fire at the house because there were children. Her children were inside. The defendant, however, fired two shots into the apartment. Noyles discovered one of the bullets on the floor at her home a few days later. 
Robert Redman, one of the emergency medical technicians who responded to the scenes, found Singleton bleeding from the mouth. After examining Singleton, Redman found a bullet hole through the victim's tongue and the roof of his mouth. X-rays revealed uh, the bullet was lodged in his neck. According to the victim, the bullet was still lodged in his neck at the time of the trial. Holy cow. So, I mean, he gets pissed off. He tries to shoot him point blank. Gun malfunctions. He goes back in his apartment, fixes whatever that malfunction was, puts two rounds into the apartment, even though kids are there and people are there. He doesn't care. Runs that into the street. Goes to hit the guy. It's blocked. That pisses him off. Then he shoots him point blank in the mouth, which is, you know, um, the odds are he should have been dead. I mean, the bullet traveled through into his neck. It's still lodged there. We don't know what's going on with him now. Um, then he, that's not enough. The guy's running away for his life. He chases him. And then puts two rounds into the home, even though, again, the kids are there. I mean, this sounds like a guy, he brushed it off as, ah, whatever, I was drinking, the guy, like... What I do? What's a big deal? It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, you sound unhinged. You sound dangerous. I mean, it was a late in his life. He didn't have other felonies. But still, how do you snap like that? Man, I don't know. So what was his discussion He says it wasn't set in second degree. He says that the witnesses were inconsistent as the attempted blow blocked by Singleton indicates the attempted manslaughter as is a more appropriate because the guy blo attempted to block him. It's manslaughter now. Defendant initially de contends that Dina and her statements police were inconsistent with the testimony. He claims manslaughter is more appropriate. He, he's making it like it was a fight, not attempted second degree. Or is it heat of the moment? I disagree. You tried once, fixed the gun, ran after him, shot him, then still continued to run after him. You're only lucky that he didn't die. I'll put this link in the description. And, um, of course, they denied his appeal. Well, what do you think? This caught me off guard that they that they paroled him, but I think maybe he just checked too many of their boxes. Act 122, parole project, 22 years on, man, on attempted manslaughter, um, no victims present. How do you feel? Thank you, Richard, for the info. And with that, I'll let you go.